replacement of IS-39. Now what uh, the effective date of the uh, standard is, at the moment is June, January 2013, uh, but uh, uh, we are not sure about the uh, effective date for uh, other aspects of the standard resulting from the impairment methodology phase and the hazard counting, maybe they may be a little different. Okay, that was a, a, a brief background on why the ISB undertook this project. IFRS 9, as I said, was released in November 2009 and deals only with the classification and measurement of uh, financial instruments. Now in developing IFRS 9, ISB was faced with a major challenge because, you know, the criticism was about the, about the complexity of IS 39. So the intention and the objective of ISB was to come up with a simple standard uh, which is not difficult to apply and interpret but technically speaking, when you go for simplicity, you have to compromise somehow on the technical soundness of the standard. Because as you become more and more complex, perhaps you can achieve more and more technical soundness of any accounting standards. So as you want to be more simple, uh, it sometimes results in compromise on the technical aspect of the standard. So that was a major challenge that okay, we wanted to achieve simplicity, but in doing so, are we compromising on any of the technical requirements or not? So the standard, therefore, uh, is, is, is a very difficult uh, 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 initiative because uh, the ISB has to uh, maintain the technical soundness as w at the same time uh, a standard which should be simple enough for users to understand and apply more easily. Now, when you talk about complexity, uh, many people believe that the complexity in the IS-39, the major driver behind that complexity is the multiple uh, valuation models that are used to measure the financial assets, meaning certain financial instruments are measured on amortized cost basis, certain financial instruments are measured on a fair value basis, and therefore, uh, when uh, the interplay between those classifications complex the whole accounting. So therefore, if you have to achieve the simplicity, perhaps the solution lies in, 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 in measuring all financial instruments on a fair value basis. That might result in reducing the complexity. That is the theory which was widely discussed during the uh, revision project of IS-39. And, but, what ISB, uh, you know, found from the comments that were received from around the world is that still there is a wide support for a mixed valuation model because people still believe there is still a technical merit in, uh, in measuring certain kind of financial assets on an amortized cost basis rather than on a fair value basis. Because if you measure everything on a fair value basis, it perhaps will not be justified keeping in view the, the nature of the asset, the, 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 the fluctuations in the cash flows relating to the asset. So all in all, people believe that still a mixed valuation model uh, is, is, is more appropriate rather than a full fair value basis accounting. But I just wanted to tell you here that uh, the approach taken by US FASB is different from this because uh, the American standard setters believe that uh, they would be more comfortable going for a full very fair value basis accounting rather than a mixed model. And therefore, uh, uh, when they, I think in May 2010, the uh, US FASB released an accounting standard update, which requires, this is a proposal stage, this is not a standard at the moment, but this, those proposals basically uh, uh, require that all financial instruments, including loans, should be measured on a fair value basis. And the gain and loss on uh, the fair valuation should go to the statement of comprehensive income rather than a PNL account. Uh, but the idea is to go for more and more fair value rather than a mixed valuation model. And that is the uh, difference in the approach between 
um, the ISB and US FASB. Uh, and this is, I think, a cause of concern uh, uh, with regard to the convergence um, uh, projects that ISB is undertaking with uh, US FASB. Now, what, I, what I'm trying to tell you is that the IFRS 9 is built around a mixed valuation model. It's not built around full fair value or full cost accounting approach. So the approach taken under IFRS 9 is that those kind of financial assets where the cash flows are highly variable, such as equity instruments and derivatives, where the cash flows are highly variable, should still be measured at fair value. And those kind of financial assets where the cash flows are relatively stable, meaning loans and receivables, uh, where the cash flows only vary with the market interest rates, those kind of instruments should continue to be measured on amortized cost basis. This is a you know, high, high level thought behind IFRS 9. So those instruments which have high volatility in terms of cash flows should be measured on a fair value basis. And those instruments where uh, the cash flows are relatively stable, like loans and receivables, should continue to be measured on an amortized cost basis. Now, therefore, under IFRS 9, there are only two categories of financial assets. One, amortized cost basis, and one on fair value basis. So there are all financial assets should be classified under e either of those categories, either at amortized cost or on a fair value basis. In comparison to IS 39, uh, where the financial assets are categorized into four and five categories at fair value through PNL account, held to maturity, available for sale, and loans and receivables. So there are, and there are certain instruments which you can also designate at fair value through PNL account. So effectively, there are five categories of financial assets under IS 39, whereas under IFRS 9, all financial assets should either be classified under the category at fair, at fair value or under the category at amortized cost. Within the fair value, there are, there are certain, uh, in certain cases, you can still, uh, uh, you know, recognize the gain or loss on remeasurement through statement of comprehensive income. We'll discuss what those conditions are. Now, according to IFRS 9, how these categories are used then, that all equity instruments are either classified as held for trading or non-trading. So equity instruments are either held for trading purposes, meaning buying and selling for a short-term gain or loss, or non-trading purposes for strategic purposes or for any other purpose, but not for trading purpose. For in case of trading investments, all it should be carried at fair value and all gain or loss on revaluation at each reporting date should go to the PNL account. So not a change from the current requirement. In case of non-trading investments, the entity will have a choice whether to, uh, 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 whether to take the gain or loss to the PNL account or to take the gain or loss through the statement of comprehensive income to the equity. But that choice should be made on the very uh, recognition, on the initial recognition of the equity instrument. So on the initial recognition of the equity instrument, on a non-trading equity instrument, that instrument should either be classified at fair value through PNL account or at fair value through statement of changes in comprehensive income. Now that is sounds very similar to the available for sale category of financial assets. But there is a very big difference here. The difference is that, you know, in case of uh, available for sale assets, the gain or loss goes to the equity through comprehensive income statement. But when this investment is sold, the gain or loss realized is transferred from the equity to the PNL account. Or if the investment gets impaired, the gain or loss that was recognized and the equity goes to the PNL account. Now, under IFRS 9, when you classify a certain financial asset, a non-trading equity instrument at fair value through OCI, 